Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the DSEF's next video podcast episode. Uh, my name is Ben Dixon, your host, and I'm very excited uh, to welcome our guest today. Gail is going to be serving as moderator today. Uh, Gail, it's been a pleasure to have you out here. Thank you for being here today. Always good to see you. Hi, everyone. Travis, our guest, is a total treat. And I'm going to introduce Travis here in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, if you're brand new to the DSEF, this is an invite-only community exclusive to direct selling executives. We have our most participation on LinkedIn. If you guys are over in the Facebook group and you're not on LinkedIn, get on the LinkedIn group. It's a lot more fun um, from folks who are involved. Um, as of the, this recording, is about 400 of us who participate in these events. And we, we take these events as a special time to talk to people who are in the industry on specific topics who are taking action that just gives us all really solid education and helps us walk through just information we can all use um, to make our businesses better here inside of the system. You know, and when we were talking about putting together an event on a compliance in the space and tips for it, um, immediately uh, Travis came to mind. And so with that, as a background, uh, Travis Wilson, heads of all business development uh, initiatives at Momentum Factor. He's a finance executive in the direct sales industry since 2016. That's when I met Travis, who's serving as CFO, right? And so Travis Bill brings a wealth of experience to his position um, at the firm. His industry experience uniquely allows him to understand specific customer needs and provide compliance solutions, right? When not working, Travis likes to spend time with his beautiful wife, kids, and two dogs. He also loves to compete in endurance sports and hopes one day to run all the world major marathons. Awesome, gang. Well, Travis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for being out here. Yeah. I'm so excited to be here. This is such an incredible opportunity, and um, it's, I'm honored that you thought of me when uh, the concept or the idea of compliance came to came to mind. It's well, an important it, uh, concept, obviously, in this space, and uh, I'd love to talk about it. Well, and, and what's so fun is, you know, sometimes when we bring someone from the vendor space to speak on a, on one of the DSCF events, they're just thinking vendor ease the whole time. And what I love about your history is just, I mean, you've been doing finance for years for other companies in the direct selling space. So you you see so much sitting in that finance seat and to then come to these compliance seats, it's just a different conversation. So grateful to have you here. Yeah, and, and I love that. Um as you mentioned, my background, I studied accounting, got a master's of accounting when I went to college, used that and worked with a couple, three different direct sales companies. So really got into kind of everything associated with that. When I came over to the business development side for Momentum Factor, it was really this, I just don't have that gene in me where I'm trying to push a sale. I just see a product that's sure. valuable. And if it works for you, great. If not, let's just be friends and talk about direct sales stuff. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, and that's and that's what's so great is ever. I mean, everyone needs some form of monitoring. We'll get into it today in their world. You gotta you gotta keep your eyes open, folks, as you're running a direct sales company today. You're, you're not wise if you don't. Um, and so, we're, as we as we jump into the questions today, this is just a perfect conversation to talk about what's relevant. So, so Gail, go ahead and kick us off. Where where should we start in this conversation? Yes. Uh, first off, welcome Travis, and welcome everyone everybody who's joining the stream and listening to the podcast. Um, today's episode is all about compliance. Its title is Keys for a Compliant Direct Selling Culture. And everybody knows that it's crucial to adhere to regulations and ensure ethical behavior, both for the success of the business and the reputation of the industry as a whole. Now, um, for the first question, I'd like to know, uh, what are the what's something that most clients in the referral space uh, forget to think about that they should really consider when it comes to mm -hmm. compliance. In the referral space, can you maybe be a little bit more specific about what you mean by that? In the in the direct uh, selling space or the referral marketing space. Got it. Yeah. Well, obviously, the strength of a distributed network, which is what direct selling is, right? You've got a bunch of untrained, sometimes unsophisticated. Sure. Distributors, representatives throughout the entire world, different countries, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and everything like that. Often they are not trained uh, very well. And so now you've got these people all over the world with little training, with different backgrounds representing your company. That's scary. <laughs> mm -hmm. They are now reflecting your brand, your products. The entire message that you've developed over however long your company has been in existence, 
you know, while that is a strength in the sense that now you're able to recruit people all over the world with all these different backgrounds to amplify and send out this message, they also now are your biggest risk. And I think that's where square one is with compliance when you're starting is, okay, we've decided to use this model where we're going to go out and use this opportunity to spread our message far and wide, but now we need to make sure we're protecting ourselves um, from the risks associated with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And when evaluating a specific compliance program, what questions should executives be asking? So great question. So executives, when evaluating a compliance program, I guess there's several different options out there. You know, the company that I work for, uh, Momentum Factor, we offer a compliance monitoring system where we'll go out and do what is probably the most labor intensive portion of compliance. And that is going out and monitoring social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, anywhere that a distributor or representative might post content. We're going out and looking for that um, and putting it in a case management system for a compliance department. I think the critical thing to think about if you're in compliant or you're an executive in this space and looking at compliance solutions is understanding that compliance is still ultimately your responsibility. Mm -hmm. So even if you hire a partner, um, even if you have these tools, never can you just take your eye off of it and assume that it's being taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, you're still responsible for making sure that the right keywords are being looked for. Often, you know, we'll have one example that comes to mind. Well, let me just present the, the, the concept first, but um, often there will be keywords that will be important for one company that are not important for another company and vice versa. If you're in some kind of unique space, maybe financial education or debt relief or something like that, there's keywords that are going to be much more important for you than for other companies. And so being able to really kind of grasp that concept and share those with your compliance partners um, whoever you're working with is really critical. I said, I, I had an idea of somebody that was doing that. And it's a company that is in um, the real estate space. Mm. So one of the things that we look for when we're doing monitoring for direct selling companies is if they say anything about the number of sales that they made. So let's say they, you know, a nutraceutical type company sold he said, you know, distributors out there saying, well, I, I made $500,000 last year. Here's the check that I made. That's a big issue. Um, especially if there's not some kind of disclaimer on it that says, this is what it took for me to earn that. This is how much time I had to put in. These are the materials that I had to buy in order to make that all of yeah. the other things that the FTC requires. Yeah, these are the ads for. I paid for that drove that traffic. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh. FTC hates that kind of stuff. They want to make yeah, sure that people are no disclosing what it took to, to earn that check. Mm -hmm. But we did have a company, like I said, that um, is in the real estate space and their distributors were talking about how much um, real estate the company sold. Well, it had nothing to do with commissions. It was just sit, talking about how the company had performed. So we had to tweak our, our algorithm a little bit in order to make sure that we weren't capturing those because they're not violations. And so if you're a compliance executive, making sure that you understand exactly what the compliance program is and how it's working. The second point that I would make on that is that if you're a compliance executive, compliance starts at the top. You can't have a CEO, CEO or president who's going out and making crazy claims about like how a distributor, if you come on board with our company, you're going to be able to make all kinds of money. You're going to solve all of your financial difficulties. Your side hustle is going to be able to allow you to go on crazy vacations and buy Ferraris and Lamborghinis and all. We've seen it. We've seen CEOs send out this great message of trying to recruit people and then kind of letting their sales team, their legal department and other people underneath them go in and clean up and say, well, you can't really say that when you're going out and doing recruiting. So it's got to start at the very top. The top executives have to have that attitude of understanding what they can and can't say and being ethical in how they communicate that message. You know, what's, what's so good about your saying, Travis, and I hope 
I think everyone, you're taking notes and you're listening to this on the stream. So he opened with like, hey, the first step, gang, is awareness. That's what I heard. He said, first, let's be aware that, hey, this is this is, this is going to be a challenge for your business. This is going to be real because of who the people are that are promoting your company. This is an independent volunteer army. The second point Travis made, gang, was the accountability. He said, hey, this you can't push this accountability on anybody else. You own this. And then the third is to remember that you're modeling. Everything you do as an executive team is modeling a specific behavior to yeah. your volunteer army. And if you model it, it makes it okay. Like, it's true. If you do any non-compliant behavior, gang, that you don't want them to do, guess what? Your actions will speak louder than your words to the team. They're going to copy you. It's good stuff, Travis. I've seen that so many yeah. times. Yeah. I, I already hit this, but you're right. I mean, this is the strength of our industry. And it's been so interesting. I've kind of seen over the last couple of years, a, a little bit of a, I don't know what the right word is, maybe a lack of faith in this model. We've seen a lot of companies trying to look for omni-channel distribution of product. They've been looking to an affiliate models. They've been looking, you know, is the direct sales model weakening? And that question's being asked. And the reality is, is I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think the strength of direct sales is still what it was hundred years ago, 50 years ago, and 20 years ago, where mm -hmm. you have this person in some corner of the world, in some small county in Midwest United States, and they have a network of family and friends, and they can take this message of a valuable product that, that helps people and share that in a way that social media marketing, you know, Google keywords, you know, whatever other advertising marketing model you're using just cannot do. Yeah. Leverage but, and trust. And, 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 like you said, though, the weakness with that is now you have that representative in some county in Midwest U.S. or some corner of the United States who is a representative that maybe hasn't been as trained as well as you would like. Yeah, and some, and it's not always egregious. No, like I love that you made that that point, Travis. Like sometimes the companies haven't done the work to create great compliance stuff to share, and then people are just doing what they think is best. They're just trying to get curiosity, trying to make some noise in the marketplace to start some conversations. And sometimes they just don't know better. And other times it's egregious. And then sometimes they just don't know better to that point. Yeah. It's it's important to see that. Gail, back to you. What's what's next from the members? These questions come out of a whole group of our members, gang. And so it's perfect for this call. So what's what's the next one? Yeah, let's do it. Yes. Thank you for, for your answers. And the next question is actually, what's the one thing that uh, you've seen that makes the largest difference when it comes to compliance in this space. You uh, you mentioned awareness, accountability, modeling the right behavior, and creating the compliant content. But what's that certain thing that you think makes the largest difference when it comes to um, compliance in this space? You're going to make me pick one thing? Yeah, it's this comes, Travis, from the executives that are like, I'm overwhelmed on objectives. I only got time to add one when it comes to compliance. What do I do? So we we get that kind of question sometimes. So here's the overwhelmed with too many objection, uh, you know, objectives to accomplish this quarter client. What would you say if they said, I only got space for one? What would you tell yeah. them to do? Every other decision would branch off of this one decision. And we've already talked about it, but it bears repeating. The culture has to start at the top. It yeah. has to be 100% buy-in by your executive team. Every person not just your CFO and your COO, your sales team, your marketing team that's developing content, everybody in that executive C-suite and from there on down from corporate has to understand that compliance is a critical component. I don't know if later we're going to get into kind of some of the recent FTC decisions and kind of the environment that they're creating, but it is expensive if you don't do it right. The fines, and I can cite some case studies if we have time later, the, yeah, the yeah, risk go ahead. That, Let's go ahead and un unpack the top two. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and share. Okay, Let's great. Do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, public knowledge here. So, um, you know, I think of United Wealth Education last year. You know, last year, this is this company that's been in business for years. Great message of financial education with people that normally don't have access to that kind of information. Some complaints came in and the FTC decided to investigate. And last year, the FTC issued a temporary restraining order against United Wealth Education. It meant that in that moment, the second that that temporary restraining order was issued, they could no longer enroll. They could no longer make sales on their website. They could no longer pay commissions. Mm -hmm. How does a company succeed at that point? 
how does a direct selling company succeed with no recruitment, no sales, and no commissions? Now, I'm going to go back in and say, the FTC also didn't have to do any due process. They didn't have to go to a court to get that temporary restraining order. They just issued it um, from their office. United Wealth Education, to their credit, fought this and four months later um, got that temporary restraining order um, lifted. But in that four months, what happened? Enrollment decreased, sales decreased, and they were left trying to rebuild that field that was damaged through that, uh, that action. And I really don't like that from the FTC. I don't like that, that they have the power to just essentially shut down a company with no due process. I'm hoping for the best for United Wealth Education. I'm in their corner and um, rooting for them to, to build that back up and succeed. But we see that compliance can be a killer. If you don't have the right program in place, if you are not developing that culture from the top down, you are putting your business at risk and every single person in your business, including your distributors. Yeah. And you hear these pieces, gang. And what's interesting, I, I was actually out with a client and they had been through an investigation from the FTC and had come out and won on their side. But what's crazy is when you win, you don't get to talk about it. <laughs> so that we, that, so you, you hear the negative stories in the news. You hear the negative stories in the space, gang. And then for the people who do the work that Travis is talking about, gang, the ones who do the compliance work, follow the rules. Are there unfair situations in the space right now where people are following all the rules and are still investigated by the FTC and it's still costing them millions of dollars going on? Yeah. there's. We could talk about New York right now if we wanted to and, and say, okay, what's really going on there? They were a, a gem of our industry and, and higher customer ratio than anybody. Why in the world would an organization mess with them? And we, we, would, just be, we would just be guessing at this point because the courts are still deciding that one. But there are others who have done it right and have won where those those actions or TROs have been lifted and and they're not allowed to talk about it. Like investigation stop. They don't just get to talk about it. But I got, I got a chance to have a meal uh, with one of my clients who had just done that last week. And it was so interesting to hear it on the other side team. So know that when you do the right things, okay, when you're actually doing the right things, um, you stand a much better shot at coming out on the other end um, than when you don't have an active plan in place. And that, yeah. that really brings us to the... The next question that's coming from our members, this is one that I get all the time, and I'm, I'm really excited to hear your answer because, Gail, go ahead and hit us with the next question. This is the one that we get the most uh, from members in the DSCF, and I think this is just a perfect kind of meat of the whole discussion for our time together with Travis about this whole proactive idea. So most compliance programs and strategy appears to be reactive programs that slap mm -hmm. reps on the wrist after the incident has occurred instead of being proactive. What tips do you have for companies that want to deploy a proactive strategy? Great question. So the two things that come to mind, um, number one, developing an educational program that trains. We talked several times about this, that you've got this uh, distributed workforce force that's often um, undertrained and um, maybe undereducated. So developing tools that require them to be educated. I know a lot of companies will do that as part of the enrollment process, that they have to go through and do some learning module. And, and part of that module will be compliance. What is a earnings claim? What is a product claim? How can you talk about income in a way that is compliant? Um, all of those kinds of things. Another option is maybe, you know, once you hit a certain pin rank that you have to go through an additional training to do that. In other words, making that training part of the advancement process I've even seen some of our clients do really creative things where taking classes and um, showing proficiency through tests and, and those kinds of things is part of their rank advancement. Yep. So if I want to hit whatever gold diamond level, I have to take this class that shows that I understand what compliance means, what uh, earnings claims are, what product claims, all those kinds of things. I think that's a really cool idea. We've also seen that when distributors may be getting a little bit of trouble and we're being reactive, that there are still are proactive steps that you can take. So you have them take those learning modules. Again, you freeze their commissions until um, they've been able to achieve a certain score on some type of compliance test, something like that. Um, so that's the first step I would say is being really creative and proactive in developing a training strategy so that you're you're providing that training to these this largely untrained workforce. Number two is right where I sit with momentum factor and monitoring. 
So a lot of companies that uh, we work with or before we work with them are simply reacting to things coming in. So maybe they've gotten a letter from the DSSRC. Maybe they've gotten a letter from the FTC. I hope you're not in that situation yet. Um, but even beyond that, a big source of a lot of complaints is other distributors. So you're reactive mm -hmm. to complaints coming in from other distributors who are saying, well, I saw mm -hmm. distributor XYZ doing this. You said I'm not allowed to do that. And and there it creates infighting and all of that. And then they're trying to organize that all in, in whatever you know, back office solution they have, um, trying to put notes in distributor record. It can be very challenging, um, very difficult. So what we offer is that monitoring service where instead of waiting for the FTC, DSSRC, or even other distributors to come back and notify you of violations, you're proactively going out and looking for that. Here's the critical component of that. The FTC and the other regulatory agencies love to see that. They've, they've said, they've said specifically, the internet is a big place. The expectation that you go out and know every single thing being said by your workforce is unreasonable. They've said that. So knowing that you are going out and doing everything that you can to monitor, even if you're not catching every single thing, at least being proactive and looking for it instead of waiting for it to come to you. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two things. I said being proactive in your training and developing a program and to developing monitoring, monitoring service so that you're not waiting for complaints to come to you. You're going out and looking for non-compliant content. Now, what I love about what you shared is even this word training. We've talked about this before in, in the DSCF. We've seen training itself expand these last few years. If you just think about what it's like. So training in the past, when we hear the word training, Travis, I think you'd agree. We always think about like, watch the video, take the test. We think of like an LMS at the end of the day or a learning management system of, hey, go watch this training, take the test green light, you passed, up, oh, red light, you didn't pass, go watch the video again. Okay, green light, you pass. And the, the way even technology has changed today, we see clients all over the space taking training to a new level. And what I, what I mean is, if you think of how like LinkedIn, when you're on LinkedIn, it tells you, go wish Travis Wilson happy anniversary, work anniversary. You know, it like suggests what to do. Or, or you go on Gmail and you start typing to your, you know, your kids and poof, starts finishing your sentence. You know, it's like, oh, did you want to say this? You know, tools today have gone so much further than they were just years ago. One of the things I have found is that it's not just the compliance department or the uh, CEO that's involved, the marketing team, like the guys who are out there crafting the content that people are supposed to be sharing, like they're just as much a part of this training as everybody else, because it, it's not just go watch the videos. It then needs to be every time they're doing something. Like I, I've seen a distinct difference, and you can speak to this too, between the companies who have said, all right, watch the training video, go get them, Tiger. And then the companies who have said, watch the video, and now here's the compliance stuff to share that's actually getting results in the marketplace. And so I, that, that used to be a response, kind of a burden of the field. And now it's a burden of corporate, this idea of like, who's going to create the stuff we actually share in social media to, to start conversations, create curiosity, get traction. I see that burden on corporate today versus the field uh, through all my clients. I, I haven't seen a different. Are, are you experiencing the same thing um, that like creating yeah. the compliant, shareable contents corporate's job now, not the fields? Oh, yeah. And and I can't think of a company out there who wouldn't prefer to make sure that that content is being generated by them internally. Hopefully it's been blessed by legal. It's been looked at by marketing and sales so that it it follows whatever message they're trying to generate. That just cued another thought in my head, Ben. You know, the way I understand this podcast working is it's not really an opportunity to sell, but Naxum, right? Sure. Uh, what, what you guys do is help to create a platform where companies can come in, post approved content for distributors to be able to share. And then once it's there, once the distributors are sharing it, you know that it's already been approved by corporate and you don't have to worry so much about that risk. So yeah, that's another one is, is developing technology tools uh, with partners in the space that can help you share that message in a safe, compliant way. Well, and, and to that, Travis, thank thank you for the and thank you for the plug, gang. The on the DSCF, we don't promote each of Yes, Gail and I have served dozens of companies at Naxum, but the but the key part to think of is some of you are sitting here watching today and saying, well, we already tried that. We already tried creating content and no one, no one shares our content. They only want to share what they create in the field. And you're saying that right now. And I, I want you to hear this, not just me, because I, I've said this a number of times, Travis says this too, is, is that gang, the only reason they're not sharing 
your corporate compliant content is because it's not working when they share it. They go out there in the marketplace and you have this, well, here's the compliant thing to share and they're sharing it and they're not getting the enough curiosity. They're not getting the result. And so don't blame the field or in that situation, it's your marketing team's fault, okay? Your marketing team, and to the scenario that Travis shared earlier, I, actually, I, I think I actually know who that real estate client is. I, I think I know them who, instead of making income claims, started saying, hey, this is the number of deals we did, which worked out for them. Hey, I, after taking this education, I was able to do this number of deals. Your marketing team needs to do the work gang until you have a compliant content that members can share in the marketplace that actually gets results. I'm going to hear those two components. This is really important. It's not enough for you just to create compliant shareable content. You have to create shareable compliant content that's getting results, that the field is willing to share, and that when they share it, it's actually getting sales. And if that's not happening, your marketing team's job is not done yet. And what's so great about tools, like what Travis is doing, and, and even tools that our team has done in the past, is on both ends of the process, you're seeing, okay, what are reps willing to share in your marketing system tools? And then on the compliance tools, you're seeing, what did they tweak? You know, they clicked share from the marketing system, the compliance thing we, we, we said, what are they changing? What are they like twisting just a little bit? Like, what's that flavor they're putting on it? You know, what's the spin they're adding to our corporate messaging? And is that a good spin? Is it working? And is it still compliant? Or is like is that like a not good spin? And we need to talk about that with them. And so I'm just so grateful for that part of what you do, Travis, in the world, because I think you you help people see the end result many times. And we're working so much on the front end of what's worth sharing inside of the space. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. You know, we we definitely want to um, encourage marketing departments to create material that is compliant and safe, but is also engaging, like you said, you know, and yeah. And make people feel like, hey, I, I want to learn more about this. I do have a little bit of sympathy for those departments. I think that sure. social media marketing can be challenging. Um, I think that it is more effective when it feels personal and when a distributor puts their personal slant on it with a little bit of verbiage or, or, or comments that, uh, from themselves. Um, but you're right, like the source of that core message has to be engaging and something that people want to share and that. Um, people want to receive. And yeah, that's where you get to have fun with it, gang. You you can't remember, if you stop having fun, it's going to be exhausting, right? No one's going to want to do it. But you you, you also have to be bold, um, just to, to Travis's point. Like we see companies today have not only, here's a content library you can share, but here's a content library you should make your own that looks like this from. So we see that where people are, you know, the corporate team's modeling like, hey, this is how you do the selfie. Well, you take the product with this video for your reel, and then the gal's not supposed to post that one. She's supposed to make her own like that one, right? And so so, so you do both, gang. You have some stuff to share and some stuff not. And when I say the word fun, I have two clients specifically. I think this is a good example, Travis, is sometimes we all think shareable content needs to be like, oh, a picture of the product, right, and how cool it is, or a picture of a happy customer's face and like go load that in the social media sharing engine. And sometimes that, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, Gail and I saw a client, actually two, who've done very well with memes from old TV shows, right? And some are old, some are some are new, but it was stuff people were sharing anyway. Like I have a, we have a client that just sold their business and they were using Disney Mandalorian memes, but it was just pictures of Baby Yoda and Boba Fett and it had different stuff written above it, just like regular people are doing in social media today. And some of you are saying, what is a meme? And you don't know, just talk to your kids or your staff and they'll tell you what it is. But we've seen that little flick of sometimes it's not the traditional marketing content that's working in social media at all. Many times it's fun stuff. Um, we have some clients in the pet food space who, yes, share pictures of funny looking cats and dogs and sell more pet food. Okay, so you just you kind of think of that. It's it's there's you gotta you gotta be bold and try a lot, and then measure what your field's willing to share, and and then measure which ones are actually working. Do more of that and let go of the others, and then and then look for those twists. Use monitoring software, whichever one you choose. Right? We don't promote specific products on the DSCF, but Travis, one of the leading providers in the space, as you interview a monitoring software for your company have one in place so that you can be tracking what they're actually saying and and you yeah. can see like oh maybe that maybe you'll get some good ideas from your field that are compliant maybe there's some stuff you need to address it helps you take ownership over the process and know what's working you know Travis, it was a super pleasure to have you on the line today thank you so much for cutting out some time in your busy calendar to join us here on the video podcast today super grateful for you 
Um, Gail, for those that are watching on our YouTube stream or LinkedIn and haven't jumped on to the new podcast, let them know where to find the podcast. Where can someone go uh, to get access to all the episodes and what we have coming up next? Thank you to everybody who's been watching and listening to the podcast. You can catch us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Google Podcasts as well. And you can also find us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, Instagram. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. You so got much. it. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.